Good evening and welcome to the webinar this, this evening um, to provide some updates on highly pathogenic even influenza here in Colorado. Uh, welcome, we are very excited to have, we have a very full panel for you all this evening to learn about where we're at in the status of avian influenza. Um, this, this webinar is open to anybody, um, so we are happy to have backyard bird owners exhibition, but anybody that's really interested in learning about highly pathogenic even influenza, we are um, happy to have you with us this evening. So um, I am Maggie Baldwin. I'm the state veterinarian here at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And it has been about a year since we've done our last webinar. I think it was in April of 2022 when we had our last webinar. And we have been now in highly pathogenic even influenza outbreak for um, more than a year. And it's hard to believe that we are here um, after a year of, of this outbreak, but we thought it'd be a good time now with spring migration starting and um, in expected increase in cases as we see those migratory birds coming through, we thought it'd be a good time to just provide an update and let everybody know where we've been for the last year and, um, and where we're expected to go in the, uh, the coming months and the coming year. So I am first going to turn it over to Becky Hoffman to go over some webinar logistics using the Zoom platform. So everybody is aware of um, how to ask questions and aware of um, what we're doing on the Zoom platform. So Becky. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are have this Zoom set up as a question and answer setup. We're going to do some presentation first that may bring up some questions. All of those questions will be answered at the end. And if you come up with questions throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. It may disappear if you're not moving your mouse around during the presentation, but if you just give your mouse a wiggle, that should pop back up at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question in there and it will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. We are recording this uh, presentation and there will be a post Zoom email sent out with the link for that. It will be posted on our YouTube page once everything is complete. And if you do need translation of any kind, please reach out to us. Uh, we can uh, try, try to accommodate you to the best of our ability, and, but that will be post webinar that will not be done during the presentation today. And again, all questions will be answered at the end, so just drop those in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Becky. Really appreciate that. So yeah, feel free as we're going through this to drop those questions in the Q&A and we will get to them. We've got plenty of time for discussion. Um, so here's an overview of what we're going to talk about this evening. It looks like a lot, um, and we've got a lot of really excellent um, speakers on this evening to, to give these updates. So I'll first start with a highly pathogenic even influenza overview, get everybody on the same page of what highly pathogenic even influenza is, and then provide updates. So where are we now? Where are we with detections across the country? And then, of course, where are we with detections here in Colorado? Um, I will also, at the end of my presentation, presentation, go over uh, our updated show and event guidance that we recently um, sent out publicly and is available on our website. We have Heather Ryder from Colorado State University that will go over the avian health program at CSU. We have Dr. Mary Wood um, from Colorado Parks and Wildlife that will talk about highly pathogenic avian influenza in wildlife on um, both the wild birds as well as the wild mammalian detections that we've had here in Colorado. And then Dr. Morgan McCarty, our assistant state veterinarian, will give you an overview of the CDA website. We have recently updated our website and broken it into two separate pages, so she'll go over that and let you know where you can find things um, about avian influenza and current status on the outbreak, um, as well as our new online reporting tool. So if you are a backyard bird owner that has experienced um, you know, any sickness or mortalities in your flock, how can you report that online um, if you aren't able to give us a call to talk about that? 
Um, at the end, Dr. McCarty will go over some frequently asked questions, and then we will open it up for an open Q&A session. So all those questions you're thinking about throughout the presentations, hopefully we answer some of those um, during the presentations, but if we haven't answered them, that open discussion time is when all of the panelists will be on and available to answer any of your questions. So with that, I am going to go ahead and get started. And what we're just gonna start first with an overview of the Colorado poultry industry. And I'm sure many of you know what that looks like in Colorado, but um, just to give you an idea, first on the commercial side, these are numbers that, that we received from um, the Rocky Mountain Regional Office. This was a February, 2022 report. And so just to give you a picture of the Colorado commercial poultry industry, for layers, about 5.12 million commercial layers in the state that produce an average of 1.56 billion eggs. Um, including our broilers on the western slope, the total chickens is about 6.26 million with a value of $21.9 million. And historically, Colorado has ranked somewhere around 15 in egg production nationwide. Um, that was a 2017 number. And then of course, we've got a lot of other poultry and birds across the state. And so that's why I think it's really important that all of you, if you have backyard birds um, or exhibition birds are on this because we do have a lot of backyard poultry and we have, we have a growing interest in backyard poultry in Colorado as well. Um, there are a lot of exhibition birds across the state. There are some specialty flocks that we have. We've got one producer on the Western slope that produces 75% of the world's fly tying feathers, for example. And then we also have a variety of water, waterfowl and game bird flocks in the state of, of various sizes. So to give everybody an idea of what highly pathogenic avian influenza is, and that's not, we, we do have a full webinar talking just about that um, in, in more detail, and that is uh, available on our website, that recording is, but just to give you a brief overview so everybody's on the same page as we go through this webinar, um, what is HPAI? So it is an avian influenza virus. Um, it, influenza A viruses, the avian influenza viruses are carried by water fowl and shorebirds really globally, and they're carried in all kinds of different um, varieties. So if you see the surface of that virus that's on the screen there, there's two surface proteins that, that classify those, those virus types, and that's the H protein and the N protein. So you probably have heard H5N1 or H1N1 or H3N2, but that's the classification of that type of virus based on those sur surface proteins. So the current strain of virus that we're seeing circulating is an H5N1 virus. Um, and when we talk about the virus being highly pathogenic, that means that that virus causes severe disease in poultry, in our domestic poultry. So things like chickens and turkeys um, and our, our game birds like pheasants and quail um, or domestic geese and ducks. And when we say severe disease, these highly pathogenic strains, which are of the H5 or H7 subtype, they typically cause more than 90% morbidity and mortality rates. And that means more than 90% of the birds will become sick and die from that virus. So it is highly pathogenic in those domestic poultry specifically. How is this transmitted? So of course, infected birds are shedding this virus. They're shedding the virus in their feces, in their droppings, in their respiratory droplets, in their saliva. So infected birds are shedding a lot of virus. Um, and then people, even though people don't become sick with this virus, we can carry that virus on our hands and our shoes and our clothing. If we come in contact with infected birds, we can act as a vector of that disease and carry that disease to another flock. Even though we don't become sick from that virus, we can inadvertently become carriers and carry that to a naive flock. Um, vehicles and equipment, same thing. Vehicles and equipment that come in contact with, with the virus or come in, in contact with those infected birds, um, they can carry the virus on their surface and bring it right into an, in a naive flock so they can infect a flock that way. So as we talk about how do we prevent it, 
um, knowing that infected birds can carry it and shed it to other birds, um, but also people and, and equipment and tools, those types of things can also carry the virus um, and infect flocks that way. So how do we prevent avian influenza? So there is no approved vaccination for this disease. For H5N1, there's no approved vaccination for poultry. Um, there's also no treatment for this viral disease. As I mentioned, it has a very high uh, mortality rate in, in birds, a very high uh, rate of, of loss in those birds. There's no treatment for that disease. So a few really important pieces is one, maintain a closed flock. So not introducing new birds is gonna be really important. That's one way maintaining a closed flock and not having new birds come in is gonna be an easy way to limit potential routes of entry. Um, and then of course, because wild birds are the, the vector that's carrying this virus, um, preventing exposure to wild birds is gonna be a really important part of that. So direct exposure, so not letting wild birds have access to your flock, and then also indirect exposure, so not letting wild birds access the feed or water or equipment that you may use with and in your flock. So really important to prevent overall exposure to wild birds. And then implementing biosecurity. So um, Dr. McCarty will show you where to find the tools for Defend the Flock on our website, but USDA has a really great program called Defend the Flock, and that goes through all kinds of biosecurity tools that bird owners can use and implement uh, in, in order to protect their flock. And all of these tools are, it's really important that they're site specific. So they're, they're specific for your flock, for your farm, for your premises, that, that those tools, it's biosecurity is not a one size fits all tool. It's really important that that is site specific. So what does avian influenza look like? So what should you as bird owners be looking, looking for um, and looking at? So avian influenza is really a systemic disease. Oftentimes one of the, the first symptoms or the only symptom that we see is sudden death in a flock. So we see um, birds that may or may not show clinical signs prior to um, prior to dying. And, and we really do see it at the flock level. So we're not seeing, you know, one or two birds here and there that are getting sick and dying. Typically we're seeing many birds um, getting sick at, at one time or dying at one time. If you have a large flock, some other things you might notice at the flock level is a decrease in feed and water consumption. So you might see a lot of your birds that are, are quiet and they're not eating and drinking. If you have layers, for example, you might see a decrease in egg production as well. And you might see those early indicators before you see some of these other very specific clinical signs or symptoms in domestic poultry. But because this is a systemic disease, we might see a lot of different symptoms in these birds, which can be really hard and challenging to differentiate than what is avian influenza versus other diseases. Um, but some of the diseases that you might see would be neurologic signs, so tremors or twisted neck or not able to walk appropriately, um, falling over, respiratory signs, so things like gasping or having difficulty breathing, digestive signs, so things like diarrhea um, or loose, loose stool depression, and again, not eating or not drinking, ruffled feathers, just birds that look fairly sick. Um, the head and the legs may have a purple discoloration. You may see swollen eyes. So again, this is something that we really see at the flock level. So how do we know if it's high path AI or another disease? Again, it sometimes can be hard to differentiate. Um, but what's important and what we're really seeing with highly pathogenic even influenza is a rapid onset in those flocks. And you're seeing many birds sick and many birds dying in a fairly short period of time. So we get a lot of calls and it's, it is A-OK -okay to call us anytime you've got questions. But we do get a lot of calls from, from folks that have a small flock and they might have one or two birds that are sick. Um, and really with avian influenza, we're seeing many sick and many dying in a short, in a short time period. So it's important to know and remember that highly pathogenic avian influenza is a reportable disease um, in the state of Colorado and in on all other states really across the nation. Um, but it can only be diagnosed by state or federal animal health officials. 
So if you call us and you say, I have some birds that are sick and we feel that it's suspicious enough for avian influenza, we will send out specially trained veterinarians or we will have you coordinate with the laboratory, with the veterinary diagnostic laboratory directly to, um, to, to drop those birds off for testing. But it's really important that that's done in the appropriate manner because this is a reportable disease and because detections in domestic poultry lead to impacts in our, our um, poultry across not just Colorado, but across the nation. So it is important that this follows the appropriate steps for diagnosis. So who do you call? Dr. McCarty is really gonna talk about um, reporting a lot more in detail, but just in general, um, you're a veterinarian. If you have a veterinarian that you work with, our office, we do have veterinarians that are on call. Um, and Heather Ryder is gonna go through the CSU avian health team. And then the USDA Healthy Bird Hotline is always a number that's available as well. So just to give you an idea of what happens then if you do end up with avian influenza or to, to give you an overview of what happens on facilities where we do have a positive detection of avian influenza, this is a guide um, from USDA to just kind of explain the different steps that happen with avian influenza detections in, um, in the United States. So of course, the first step is to detect. And that, like I said, has to be done by state or federal field veterinarians. Um, and then if we do have a positive um, that we, we receive from, or a confirmed positive from USDA's National Veterinary Services Laboratory, that facility or that premises is then quarantined. Um, for, for folks that are interested in, um, in receiving indemnity, uh, whether it's backyard or commercial, then we, USDA walks through an appraisal process with a field reimbursement specialist and then the, um, the producers are provided indemnity for any birds that are depopulated or euthanized on a positive facility. Um, the compensation is for the indemnity. They also pay compensation for on um, commercial facilities, things like cleaning and disinfection and the, the depopulation and disposal activities that happen. And then disposal, so appropriate disposal of those infected or exposed birds is really important to minimize the disease transmission from an infected facility. The next step is virus elimination. So um, if, it's, if it's commercial facility, the process looks very different for virus elimination than it does for a backyard facility. In backyard facilities, typically the process is 120 day fallow, meaning sitting empty for 120 days um, under quarantine without bringing new birds back in. And that is enough time that the, the virus will then be inactivated and we don't have to worry about that infecting the new flock. Um, for, for the facilities that are commercial, they go through a very rigorous process for virus elimination that includes some form of cleaning and, and disinfection or fumigation. And then we do environmental testing. So we actually go through and swab those facilities, make sure there is no avian influenza virus left in those facilities so that, that when they get to the point of restocking, um, we do an agreement for restocking and then those birds um, hopefully will not be coming into an environment where there is virus. All that virus, all the testing has been completed and, and we've determined um, that, that that facility is negative. And then one really important piece is once that facility is restocked, that they continue to maintain biosecurity because those birds that they bring back in are just as susceptible to the virus as the ones they just lost. So this whole picture, um, depending on the type of facility, takes a very different length of time for a backyard versus a commercial facility. But all of these steps are really important in the process. So where are we now in this outbreak? As I mentioned, we are over a year into the outbreak nationwide. And to give you a picture of what that looks like, this is USDA's website um, and, and it is available. You guys can look this up. Um, this was the numbers as of March 6th. So I, I could have, as of March 8th, my apologies. Um, so a week ago, this is what it looked like. And I'm sure this is bigger um, since then because the picture is changing daily and certainly weekly. Uh, but now a year into the outbreak, we have had highly pathogenic even influenza confirmed in 790 flocks across 47 states. 
And the split between commercial versus backyard, there's been 321 commercial flocks and 469 backyard flocks that have affected more than 58 million birds nationwide. And when I say birds, that's more than 58 million domestic poultry that have been affected. This is not the wild bird picture. Dr. Wood will talk about that but more than 58 million affected. And when we say affected, that's the number of birds that were on those infected premises that either died from the virus or were euthanized or depopulated um, due to exposure to the virus. And here's a picture of the map. This, uh, this picture is nationwide total in the outbreak um, for number, the number of birds affected per state. So you can see Colorado actually has ranked number three nationwide with the total number of birds impacted in our state. And to give you a better picture of what that looks like, we have had 22 premises affected here in Colorado with highly pathogenic avian influenza, and that has impacted more than 6.2 million birds across our state. The split between um, commercial and backyard facilities, we've had eight commercial facilities affected here in Colorado. Um, one of those was a broiler breeder facility on the western slope. So broiler breeders are the, the hens that lay the fertile eggs that go on to become our, our broilers um, that, we, that we have in the grocery stores. And so that was when one of our first commercial facilities affected. And then we've had five table egg layers. Um, it actually was four table egg layer premises, but five table egg layer detections. And fortunately, one of our commercial facilities was actually impacted twice. So they were impacted last summer. And then that facility after restocking was impacted again in December before Christmas. So you can see actually the total number of, of table egg layers uh, it affect, affected has actually been more than 100% of what our total table egg layer inventory was. And that's again, because one of the facilities was impacted twice. We also had one pullet facility that was impacted and then a game bird facility impacted. We've had 14 uh, non-commercial or backyard facilities and that has ranged anywhere from two to 600 birds across the state. So this is a map of the counties detected. Again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because Dr. McCarty is gonna talk about this, but this is an interactive map that's available on our website. And you can click on your county and see when the latest detections were, what those detections look like. There's also um, a, a correlating spreadsheet that goes with this that we're keeping track of all of those detections. And you can keep track of those real time as they are confirmed. So what's on the horizon? Um, where are we at? What are we expecting to see? Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this, we do anticipate that we're going to see an increase in cases as spring migration begins. And that's really starting about now um, and through the next month or so. So we, we expect that to happen on the wild bird side that as those migratory wild birds are coming through, they're still carrying, they're still shedding this virus. And so we, we could have more spillover of the virus into our domestic poultry operations. So right now is the time we are reaching out to everybody and we're, we're really trying to get good communications and good outreach to all bird owners. So whether backyard or commercial flock owners um, and really understanding where we're at and, and what the next steps are. And really the next steps are, how do we implement enhanced biosecurity for those flocks, to protect those flocks from the wild birds, to protect additional incursions of the disease into those flocks. There's a lot of other, and we'll, we'll answer some of the questions at the end. There's a lot of other things we're looking into. Um, you know, USDA is for the first time looking into the possibility of vaccination across the nation. Not currently an option, but we will address some of those in the frequently asked questions as well. Um, so, you know, right now is the time. It's it's been really difficult because we've been in this for a year, um, and and it seems like we're going to be in this for another long period of time, an unknown period of time. And I think people get very um, exhausted by the amount of work we're asking everybody to do in, in increasing their biosecurity and protecting their flock. But especially now, um, as we see those migratory birds coming through, it's gonna be critically important to increase biosecurity to protect those flocks and protect spillover into our domestic poultry. So again, next steps. 
practice biosecurity, utilize that USDA Defend the Flock um, program and look at your facility and what, what you can do to protect your flock. Monitor your flock for clinical signs and symptoms of avian influenza. And then if you see something, report that. And again, Dr. McCarty will go through um, what the reporting options are right now, including that online reporting tool. So really important for your flock, know your normal. Know what's normal for your birds for their laying production. Um, know what you know, their normal symptoms and clinical signs are for, for other diseases and avian influenza. Know what normal is so you have a point that you're going to call if something doesn't look right. And the last thing I wanted to go through just really briefly, this is something we updated very recently, is our show and event guidance. I think many of you, if you're bird owners, are aware that we had put an emergency rule into place last year to suspend or temporarily suspend shows and fairs and exhibitions. So just it's, it is important that everybody understands that commingling of birds, so meaning Birds from different flocks coming together for any purpose, whether that's an event or sale or some sort of, of co-mingling event where, where birds from more than one flock are coming together, that does present a risk for disease introduction for highly pathogenic avian influenza and other diseases. Um, but certainly during a large scale disease outbreak, like we've seen, Commingling of birds does present a risk for disease introduction. So it's going to be really important that if events are held, um, that there's a lot of steps put in place. And we really broke it down into three buckets. So what can you do before an event? What can you do during an event? And what can you do after an event to best protect your flock? And you can see a lot of those revolve around biosecurity. So Dr. McCarty can show you where this is available on our website as well. Um, but really important, again, in all of those steps that you're implementing those biosecurity practices, for event organizers, we're really recommending site-specific or event-specific biosecurity plans and a plan for monitoring the health of birds during an event. And then after an event, before you bring your flock back home and you introduce it to, if you have birds that you left at home, before you bring those birds back home, go through a 14 day isolation period. So keep them in a different coop in a different area on your farm before you bring them back to the rest of your flock. And then of course, monitor those birds if you brought any equipment to a commingling event, a show, a, a fair, or a sale, make sure those are thoroughly cleaned and disinfected before being brought back to your flock. So I think that is all that I had. I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we can turn it over to our next presenter. Um, let me see, and that is Heather. There Heather Ryder with the Colorado State University Avian Health Program. Heather, if you want to um, go ahead and share your screen, hopefully now that I've stopped, you can share yours and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. All right, we'll get this queued up here. Hold on one second. Are you guys able to see that okay? Yep, and then just do the display settings, Heather, to flip presenter, um, swap presenter and... Oh, yeah. Where did it go? Hold on. I lost my picture here. Where did... Let me stop that for a second. Hold on, it got a little wonky on my end. <laughs> All right. Where is it? I can see it on our side, Heather. It looks okay. It just needs to be in presenter mode. Sorry, like the screen, the double, the, for some reason it disappeared on my end and I don't know where it went. Um, apologize. 
and then oh yeah so hold there on, you go on. there we go settings. yep and then just do the swap presenter perfect. and slideshow perfect all right did that work <laughs> that's that's right you are that's on the hardest part slide. of the presentation right there, there. you go <laughs> all right hi everybody thank you um my name is heather Ryder. i'm here with the colorado avian or i'm with the colorado avian health program at here at colorado state university um and as dr baldwin said today i'm going to talk a little bit about our program not a whole lot but just kind of give you an overview of who we are uh what we do and then i'm going to just talk a, a lot about or a lot a little about the diagnostic lab and kind of submitting testing and kind of how that works on our end. And um, and then hopefully that helps you as um, the poultry um, lovers out there, um, you know, gives you a little bit more guidance when you're trying to, um, uh, hold on, I just moved forward. So I, this picture here just is a little bit, if you, if I saw that we have quite a few folks that we work with out there, um, you know, with the NPIP program and stuff, but if you've seen us out there, we're usually in green bibs. Um, we travel around the state, we're at uh, live bird markets, auctions, um, and typically this is kind of what we look like in this picture out there kind of with the poultry. Um, so this slide here just kind of shows all the different work that we do. Um, so I'm going to talk so at the top of the screen there you'll see kind of the veterinary diagnostic laboratories. Uh, you'll actually see that's that's a tube of BHI that is actually the media that we use when we are testing for influenza, you know, we do a swab. Um, so we are part of uh, the diagnostic labs here we do a lot of avian health testing here at the diagnostic lab and we help facilitate kind of a lot of that testing that is coming into our lab. So that's kind of one of the roles that we we uh, we serve here. We are also the National Poultry Improvement Plan official state agency. Um, so we um, kind of administer that program here out of Colorado State University. So if you, the NPIP program is a lot of times, it, we have a lot of backyard flocks that are involved in it. Um, a lot of times if you're going to exhibition, you're trying to sell hatching eggs or move birds over state lines. Um, or you're selling to other NPIP participants, um, that's where you'll, it meets testing requirements, one of those being avian influenza, um, but disease testing basically to meet those federal and state regulations. So we, we run that here out of the, out of the um, Colorado State University. Um, we also are out there in, at, at poultry events. So that picture on the left, that's my team. We're a fairly small team. Um, Dr. Pavlonia, she's the director here of the diagnostic lab, but she's also our poultry veterinarian. Um, so we're out at shows, fairs, swaps, auctions, feed store. That's kind of what we're doing right now. We're in the springtime, so we go do a lot of surveillance um, at these events. Um, so we're doing feed stores right now. So the, that's the fun part of our job is that we get to play with baby chicks. That's not all, all bad right now. Um, but then the kind of the big at the bottom here, we have surveillance. Uh, it's really just kind of the big picture of all the other things that we do. So sometimes that's outreach. We're out there talking to um, 4-H groups or talking to different groups, getting them ready for fair or talking about diseases. Um, you know, Dr. Baldwin already talked a lot about biosecurity. Um, we do that for the National Poultry Improvement Plan, but we're also there to help kind of answer questions and help flocks become more biosecure. So if they have questions about that, they can call us. Um, you know, we also get involved in response. So when the state needs extra help, extra hands kind of dealing with like an outbreak like this, you know, they might call us and 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 we step in and try to help them out as best we can. And we also run the avian health hotline. I'm going to put this number up a few times. Uh, it's more than just a hotline. Really, it is the avian health program at the diagnostic lab. So if you're needing high path testing or you suspect that you have something going on in your flock, we are one of the numbers you can call. I know we kind of throw up a lot of numbers and sometimes you're like, who do I call for what? Just call one of them. Um, like I said, this takes a village um, kind of doing this high path work. It can't be done by one agency, one organization. Um, they will direct you if you got to the wrong place, they'll direct you to the correct place to go to um, and vice versa. So if you call us, you know, maybe we can't, you know, do it, but we'll make sure that you, you know, you get the answer you need. Um, so like, again, we kind of fill, this is kind of where our program sits and we work throughout the state with all from commercial producers, you know, to our backyard flocks. Some are in the NPIP, you know, and some are just kind of getting started. So we kind of, we work fully within that system. Okay, the next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna really just kind of spend some time kind of on the diagnostic laboratory here. Um, so. 
We are a full functioning diagnostic laboratory. We work with companion animals, horses, livestock, poultry. You know, we work with animals here. Um, we, um, our clients, you know, they range from veterinarians to just owners, uh, zoos, state, federal agencies, um, shelters, sanctuary, sanctuaries. We're like, a, we're a full um, service for, you know, animal health. Um, we have three labs, Fort Collins here being our largest lab and kind of the main lab, and that's up here in Fort Collins, Colorado. We have a lab on the Western Slope, that's our Grand Junction lab, so they serve the community that they work within, and we have another one down in Rocky Ford. Uh, again, um, and all these labs kind of service the community, so sometimes like if not everyone lives up near us, and so if, if you're near one of our other labs, we might coordinate with them to get your testing or your samples too. So, um, you know, we have resources, and that's why we say call us first so we can kind of help get you so you're not, um, not knowing where to, where to go and how to do it correctly. Um, so this, this, this picture here is a little sneak peek into our lab. This is our BSL-3 laboratory. Um, you know, you know, because highly pathogenic avian influenza is a zoonotic disease, which means there's a potential from animals spill over into humans, we want to take, even within the diagnostic lab, utmost precautions, making sure that that virus doesn't get out. Um, so we perform all that testing up in our BSL-3 lab. Um, this picture isn't of avian influenza testing, but it's a similar, this is when we were um, responding to the coronavirus. So we, we are a full functioning lab and we're able to scale up fairly quickly um, and we can handle a large volume of testing um, and kind of help out, you know, wherever we're needed um, within the, the, the animal health and human um, health sector at times. So one of the services that, you know, we provide to poultry owners is necropsy services. Um, so that's what we call it kind of in the animal world. It's a necropsy, but in the human world, it's called an autopsy. But essentially, it's a postmortem examination. Basically, if something has died, we want to figure out the cause of death. So that is a service that we offer here sometimes in poultry. It is the best diagnostic tool we have is necropsy services. Um, and a lot of you have interacted with our lab kind of in a normal time and you'll want to just submit, you know, you would just submit a bird just like normal. Um, things are, we still take animals, all animals, but we handle them a lot different now. So that's why we want to kind of call and coordinate. And at the end of my presentation, I'll go into more details about how you can kind of interface with our lab. Um, so you'll see here, there's just a couple pictures, um, you know, just kind of showing the necropsy. I mean, Dr. Baldwin already kind of spoke about this, so I'm not going to take time to go into the details of um, highly pathogenic, um, you know, what we see with it. But like this, this chicken, you know, that's kind of like the kind of the poster child of high path, right? We, we show a chicken with like hemorrhage. Um, but basically what's happening is you're getting fluid and blood kind of build up within the tissues. Um, the virus itself makes like the blood vessels kind of leaky. And that's where you kind of get that kind of hemorrhage and it can like leak into the tissues. And that's kind of where you get that appearance. Again, it doesn't always show up, but it can show up. Um, I think this picture is really neat. This is a picture from Dr. Pavlonia. She worked um, on the original strains of, this is kind of the great, 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 great grandparent of the current strain. This was up in Asia, but it, it does show that kind of high mortality um, that we tend to see when we're dealing with influenza. So we tend to, it's not just like a bird that died this week and then one that died three months ago. That's not typically a sign of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, typically, it's a, a large kind of mortality event in a very short window within a week or so. Um, again, you know, just depending on coops and how your barns are set up, it, it, that can be rapid or slow. I mean, there are other factors, but it is, you know, we tend to see kind of large mortality events. Um, so this, if you guys do submit um, tests to us, this is typically what's run. Um, so we tend to run, um, there's two main tests for influenza testing. We use a PCR um, and the PCR ampl amplifies the RNA, which is the genetic makeup of the virus. So we'll have a PCR that's specifically to detect, um, detect that genetic material in this particular flu virus. Um, and so to collect that sample, it's, it's not too difficult. Typically it's an oral pharyngeal swab. So that like, if you've ever had strep throat, it's basically just a swab of the mouth. That's what we do in the chicken. We just swab the mouth um, really well. 
Um, and then we put it in, like I said, uh, this BHI um, brain heart infusion media. It's kind of got uh, growth material in there just to kind of keep the virus alive, but it's a fairly benign material otherwise. Um, we can also do a tracheal swab. Typically that's done on either a very large bird like a turkey, but we wouldn't typically do that on a live like chicken because tracheas are fairly small and we don't want to cause damage or harm. Um, or we do it on necropsy. Or we can do a cloacal swab, which is essentially a butt swab. So that, that's kind of how we get the test. Um, and so depending on the type of bird and how they're shedding it, it's usually one of those kind of swabs. And usually that's what you're submitting, or you may not be submitting the swab to us, but that's how we're collecting the sample to run the test that we need to run to detect bird flu. Um, the kind of the picture, the graph on the right, what happens is if, it, if that virus is present, um, it's just showing the amplification of that virus. So that RNA is in there. And so, um, so that's what we're seeing is that that virus is present and that's what we're reading on uh, PCR. Um, but just again, for us to pick that up, the virus has to be present. So that means that the bird has to be shedding the virus actively or it, you know, it basically it's infected, right? So that's how we pick it up on PCR. And that's usually real time. And typically, you know, you're seeing clinical symptoms when we're kind of testing for it. Um, the other test that we use a lot during surveillance is um, serology, or we'll use serum, which is a part of the blood. So we'll either run an AGID, with this, which is an agar gel immunodiffusion test, or we'll run an ELISA, which is an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. So um, those are the two um, kind of serology tests that we use. Um, so if you think about a virus and you get sick, um, you, your body starts producing antibodies, right? Because that's what happens when we get sick. Our body kind of tries to fight it. So same with animals, um, same with this flu virus. And so that, that those antibodies will be present. And the thing about antibodies is sometimes they can be present. Um, so it's a, it's a way for us to look at current infection and sometimes infection in the past um, because those antibodies in some viruses can be present for years. Um, and you know, in, in, in this case kind of can be present for quite a, quite a number of months with uh, influenza virus. So that, you know, if your bird was exposed four months ago, survived it, and then we ran a blood test on it today and it had come in contact with influenza, we would be able to detect it on serology. So it has kind of a, you know, we can kind of do a look back for antibodies and kind of current infection. But most of the testing, if we've got like die off or kind of a, a big event, it's going to, most of it's going to be PCR. Typically, um, the serology is used more for like large commercials, commercial flock surveillance and stuff like that. Um, so if we do have a positive, what happens? Um, so we get a positive here in our lab. Um, you know, we work really closely with the USDA, uh, Colorado Department of Ag to notify them. Um, and then they kind of start working with the flocks. Um, and then we have to send that sample off to the National Veterinary Service Lab in Ames, Iowa. And then they run a confirmatory test to say, yep, we got the same result. Um, all labs throughout um, the US that run this test um, have to do that. And then that's a confirmatory test. And then that's kind of when we, depending on your flock, that's when you'll be working with Colorado Department of Ag to determine in the USDA to just determine the best um, approach with your flock if, if it is positive. All right, so this is kind of just, this just shows all the laboratories. There's about 50 throughout the United States. Um, the, it's the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. So it's a very large network. Um, there are a lot of pretty colors all over this map to not kind of, um, but really what those colors represent are different foreign animal diseases that these labs test for, that they're certified to test for. So in, in this case, uh, influenza is the little pink Pac-Man, right? So, um, you know, it, I know it's probably hard to pick it out, but if you look at Fort Collins, um, we're there, we do a lot of testing. You can see we've got a large um, kaleidoscope of colors over our lab, um, but you can see most labs throughout, most non labs have the ability to test for a lot of different agents. I think we run over 50 different kind of PCR tests within our diagnostic lab right now. Um, but yeah, so this is a large network um, and sometimes we're doing the wild bird surveillance, you know, they divide that up across the different labs and, um, and then we also do our domestic um, 
tests here. And we, we run over, um, we can run over a thousand tests if we needed to kind of in a day. So we do really, like I said, have high throughput capacity. Um, but just to put some numbers to kind of what this last season looked like for our lab, um, we ran over 4,635 PS, uh, PCR assays um, last year, kind of during this kind of outbreak. Now that's, that's fairly high for us. Um, but that was just the number of testing we did. Now, some of those samples, those like tubes that we were showing you, we can pool in the small tubes up to five birds and in the large tubes up to 11 birds. So sometimes, because it's a flock-based disease, when it comes to poultry, a lot of times we can pool samples. Um, and so we can, like one test can test like up to 11 birds, but it's testing a flock. So to kind of put that in perspective, that means that our reach can kind of the number of flocks or kind of birds that we tested was around 9,000 birds in the state of Colorado or 9,000 flocks, right? Because those a lot of those are individual flocks. So that's that's quite a bit of surveillance that we did um, throughout the state of Colorado um, or testing that we did around high path this year. Um, and you know, we'll in and if you guys want, there's our phone numbers at the bottom, but we have a new website too. So if you guys go to our website, all the testing and all the stuff that we do at the diagnostic lab is on our new website. So it's easy to just Google, you know, CSU vet diagnostic lab and you'll 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 come right to our page. And this is the last slide in my slide set. Um, but so so there's a lot that goes into into bird flu, right? There's a lot that goes into this diagnostic testing. We want to keep ours, us safe on this end. So when we receive your bird and we want to keep you safe. So that when you guys have, when you're trying to submit to our lab or, and you want to submit for high path testing, please call us because we can help if you're like somewhere else in the state, maybe there's a veterinary clinic that's willing to help like either collect the sample or ship the bird. We have a lot of um, options on our end and you know and that way you too have to struggle less what we don't want is just a chicken dropped off on our doorstep that's you know that's not safe right now we're asking everyone to double bag them disinfect the outside if they are dropping off a body um, you know for us to perform the test and if I know what's coming in too we can kind of watch for it um, if you really have a high mortality case you know sometimes people might want to test just because they just peace of mind they want to rule it out and we do have you know, if you, we have some uh, availability to do some free testing, but it, in order to like get that free testing, you need to call us first to make sure it's something we can do. So some people do just want peace of mind. I've had a couple birds die in the last few days and I just kind of want to rule that out. You know, we can help there. Or sometimes you actually have a lot of, you know, a high, you know, a, a situation where it's looking like we've got more mortality and we really kind of want to test and we can definitely help with that too. So we're very connected. It takes a village. Um, we're a part of that. Um, here's our email. Again, here's that hotline phone number. You know, when you call, you're just calling that small team. Um, and, and we're here to help get you guys where you need to go and get your, your submissions in to the best that we can. So I think that's what I've got. So, you know, um, believe it at that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Heather. Really appreciate that. Excellent overview. And um, and the teamwork, um, as you said, it does take a village and we are very uh, happy that we have Heather and CSU and, and the CSU team. So next up, uh, we will turn it over to Dr. Mary Wood with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to give us a picture of what we are seeing on the wildlife side. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Hopefully that shows up okay. We can see it just in put it in presentation mode and we should be good to go. There you go. Looks perfect. All right. Wonderful. Well, good evening. I am Mary Wood. I am a veterinarian with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm going to talk a little bit on what we're seeing with high path AI in our Colorado wildlife. Obviously, when we talk about avian influenza, we're always talking about wild birds to some extent. So these particular influenza A viruses that are host adapted to avian species have co-evolved with our wild water associated birds. So these viruses do naturally circulate in our wild water on shorebirds. However, historically, we really have not seen widespread disease or mortality in our wild birds associated with avian influenza. And a big reason for this is our wild birds historically were reservoirs for the low path AI viruses and were not typically reservoirs for high path AI. 
So the historic paradigm, I guess, for avian influenza was those low pass viruses had to pass through poultry before they mutated to a high pass version. And typically, we did not see those high path versions getting transmitted back to our wild birds. Now, that situation has changed. You know, the beginning of that shift really dates back to the late 1990s with virus emerging in China and Europe. And subsequent changes to the virus allowing that to be transmitted back to wild birds, starting to see that circulate in wild birds. So in North America, the first time we really saw high path AI in our wild birds was actually in 2014, 2015, with that short-lived outbreak that we had. In that case, it was relatively short-lived. We didn't see that persist long-term. We just saw just a little bit of wild bird mortality. But the situation that we're dealing with now is different, where we are seeing a widespread and high path AI circulating in our wild birds. And in some areas, we're seeing widespread mortality and disease in some of our wild bird species. So we've been asked quite a bit with this particular disease outbreak, what to expect and what are we going to expect moving forward? And the reality is, is I don't know. This is new for us. This is something new that we're seeing with our wild birds. So we are learning right alongside with all of you in what we're going to be seeing moving forward. Uh, we do have a passive targeted surveillance program for high path AI through Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Health Program. The goal of that program is really to just monitor the distribution and occurrence of high path AI over time in Colorado, as well as the species that are affected. We do this by monitoring by species, county, and season. So within that surveillance program, once we've detected high path AI and confirmed it in a Canada goose in Weld County in winter, we don't test additional Canada geese in Weld County again until spring. So this lets us follow that disease occurrence over time, see where it's active, what species it's active in. We rely heavily on reports from the public as well as from our own field personnel on the ground. And cases that we consider suspects that we will consider for submission are gonna be where we see three or more dead within a two week period in a sort of specific area. If we see a live animal with clinical signs of disease, so a live animal that is looking sick. And then we do some additional diagnostic work for particular research projects where we have collared animals or animals with transmitters where we're collecting a lot of additional health data. So this passive surveillance program really augments USDA Wildlife Services active surveillance program. So they have federal funding for national wildlife uh, high path AI surveillance. So they're focusing on the entire country, really looking and trying to understand things like the dynamics of this virus, how the virus may change over time, uh, prevalence of the virus, and they have very specific sample size targets by different waterways across the entire country. And so obviously, since we're dealing with migratory birds that are crossing many, many state lines, in order to really understand this disease and the dynamics of the disease, you need to look at that larger ecological scale. So we're often asked, you know, why are we not doing prevalence estimates? Why are we not testing every bird? You know, why are we not looking at viral dynamics? And that is because that's being done at the appropriate ecological scale by USDA Wildlife Services. However, all of the samples that we collect through our program, all of that information is reported to USDA. All that data goes to them and can be used to augment their surveillance programs. So another thing we're often asked is our diagnostic process. So how does this work? What happens when you see sick or dead wild birds in the landscape? Who do I call? Um, so our wildlife health program is really just a small unit within parts of wildlife. There are really just two of us that are coordinating all of our sampling and surveillance efforts surrounding high health AI. So we really rely on our local field offices, our local field personnel to coordinate a lot of the samples, coordinate a lot of the submissions. So when people witness uh, sick or dead birds on the landscape, the guidance is to contact your local CPW office and provide them with that information. What those folks are gonna then do is they'll contact our wildlife pathologist 
to help determine whether or not this is a case that meets our submission criteria and surveillance priorities. Um, if the case does not meet those criteria and we aren't going to do testing, our local field offices are still gathering that information and they're putting it into our avian mortality database. So we're still capturing the information that's being reported, but we aren't going to test birds from every single report that we receive. If a case is considered to meet our submission and surveillance criteria, then we'll work with those local field personnel to either collect a whole carcass or to collect swabs from various carcasses to submit to a wildlife health laboratory. Whether they do a carcass or swab depends on a number of things. Some of it's just logistics on how easy it's going to be to get that carcass to our laboratory. Sometimes it might be species specific. We're working really hard to get carcasses for any mammalian suspects into our lab for a full necropsy. And you know, we have other disease surveillance programs going on like lead surveillance and eagles, where we really work to get some of those species in for bony crops as well. So once those samples come to our lab, if there are carcasses, that's going to be necropsy by our board certified veterinary pathologist to look at cause of death, get additional information about that case, take samples. And then any hyperopia samples that she collects, as well as those that are submitted just in the swab form to us, those are all going through Colorado State better than diagnostic laboratory. And so we've been really lucky to get to work with the CSU team on this effort. All of these cases, um, everything that we submit, we actually partner with CDA and we are tracking these cases together with them. We know that this is a significant disease of concern for um, poultry. And so we are working very closely with CDA and tracking all of these cases. So as far as what we've really seen, you know, the very first con confirmed case that we had was last March, I think it was March 24. We did see sporadic detections, particularly through late spring, early summer, and then again in early fall to mid fall. And we did have some really large scale mortality events that we saw in November that coincided with fall migrations really, really large congregations of snow geese on some of our waterways. So luckily those were relatively short-lived. However, we have continued to see detections of high path AI in wild birds throughout the entire winter. And we do suspect that high path AI is present anywhere that we have wild waterfowl present. So we just assume that the virus is present pretty widespread across the state because we are continuing to get cases. From what we've seen ourselves and what's been reported and clinical signs that we see in wildlife, um, similar to poultry, sometimes you're just going to see a bunch of dead birds. However, the most common signs that we see in live birds that are looking sick are neurologic signs. So they may be swimming in circles, walking in circles, and then they may have a head tilt or just sort of an inability to control their head or lift their head up. They may appear really incoordinated. A lot of the reports we get uh, say that they look drunk. Um, we've seen seizures, uh, especially we've seen seizures in some of our mammal cases um, and head tremors. And then we can have just, you know, depression, lethargy, and you know, birds that aren't looking very good, a little ruffled feathers, don't want to eat. But then, of course, there are some species of birds where you really aren't going to see any clinical signs at all, and they may appear perfectly healthy, but still be harboring the virus. And so that's in, particularly in our dabbling ducks, um, maybe having this virus on board without showing any signs of disease whatsoever. And so that's why even if you're not seeing sick or dead wild birds, if you're seeing waterfowl in an area, there is a good chance that there could be high path AI in that area. So we have had several mammal cases and I know these have gotten a lot of attention. I think when things are furry, they maybe garner a little bit more than the most other things. Um, right now, because of the level of interest in mammal cases and particularly level of interest from a public health standpoint, we aren't limiting mammal testing. So every suspect case that we have reported, we work really hard to try and get that in and get any crops and do testing. We have had 15 confirmed positive mammal cases so far. So majority of those being striped skunks, but we've also had four mountain lions, 
two bobcats, two red foxes, and a black bear. All of these are, you know, tested initially through CSU, but confirmatory testing happens through the National Veterinary Lab in Ames, Iowa. And part of the work that they do is also deep sequencing and looking at the genetics of these viruses. And the mammal cases are of particular interest, and I know that's something that USDA is really looking closely at to see whether or not they see any changes in the genetics of the virus that might indicate a change in dynamics. So far from the case histories of the mammal cases that we've received, we have nothing to, to lead us to believe. We have evidence of mammal to mammal transmission, um, but that is something where the genetic work that USDA is doing can be pretty helpful. Now folks have gotten really excited about the mammal cases, but where we actually probably are most concerned is our wild bird cases. So just with the number of, of birds that have come through our lab and the numbers associated with that, we have seen eight to 10,000 snow goose mortalities, over 2,000 Canada goose mortalities, over 140 raptors and associated scavengers, and you know, a handful of various other species that we've seen um, high path AI in. And this is where we do get concerned you know, our snow geese, our Canada geese populations are robust. They can likely handle all this level of mortality in the short term, but some of our raptor populations are not going to be so robust. And we do worry that this disease, in addition to other factors that are influencing survival on the landscape, could be detrimental to some of those raptor populations. And certainly, if we are going to continue seeing high path AI moving forward in the long term, Will persistent disease have an impact on some of these other populations in the long term? And we don't really know the answer to that. Um, and we don't really know the answer to what we're going to see with this disease in the long term. But our wild birds are probably where our greatest concern with high health AI exists at the moment. And so Moving forward with uh, what to expect now, what's going on now. So we are right in the heart of our spring migration. So our wild water associated birds, they are all moving through Colorado right now. They move through in March and April, and most of them are going to be on their breeding grounds by May. One of maybe the saving graces of spring migration is it is potentially a little bit quicker than fall migration. They're pretty eager to get to those breeding grounds, so they aren't going to linger as much as they might do in the fall. Um, and so we do hope we can see them move through to the breeding grounds relatively quickly. However, even once they get to their breeding grounds, we have some local populations. You know, some of these birds are going to stay in Colorado and they're going to breed here, so they don't all leave the state. Uh, come May, we will still have some amount of waterfowl in the state. So potentially some amount of high path AI is still circulating in the state. However, we really will not have the large concentrations of waterfowl like what we see in the spring and in the fall. Um, so we do hope that virus activity will decrease a bit over the summer months. And that is all that I had. And so I can stop sharing and turn things over to the next speaker. Great. Thanks, Dr. Wood. And I am Dr. Morgan McCarty. I'm the Assistant State Veterinarian here at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And I am going to attempt to share my screen. It was giving me a little bit of a fit earlier. So hopefully it wants to work and if someone could just confirm for me that's um, good morgan okay great thank you so much so i'm going to cover kind of the resources and some frequently asked questions and, and i have quite a few um frequently asked questions that i'm going to go over and hopefully that will answer some of those that have already been um, posed in the q a um, section on zoom and um, for those questions that we haven't answered yet we will save those to the end and we will get to those. So um, for those interested in um, seeing those um, questions answered, just hang tight till the end. We have plenty of time at the end for more questions. So um, don't feel like um, if you asked a question, we will, we will forget you. Um, we did also receive a couple questions 
through our um, submit a question prior to the webinar form. So those will be answered as well in my FAQs. So what I'm gonna go over first is really how we navigate our new website. And here is the link to our HiPath AI landing page. And actually um, I will be sending out, I had put in the chat, but I just wanna make sure everybody knows um, if you registered for this webinar, you will receive the post webinar email and all of these links will be included in that email as well as a transcript of the questions and answers. And then as well, we will include um, the uh, phone numbers for, for contact. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our website overview. And here's our landing page. So if, if you click on that link that Dr. Baldwin just put in the chat, this will be our, our landing page. And um, the nice thing about state accessibility is such that um, if you need to see this um, website in, the, in another language, just go ahead and click in the upper right-hand corner, select the language, language you would like to see it in, and it will come up in that language. So you can see here, I selected Spanish, um, but, but there's a whole um, list of languages um, which makes it very accessible. So if you have friends, um, family members, or employees who, who need this information in another language, um, it is accessible there for you. So scrolling down um, on our website, we have uh, what flock owners can do and, and some steps. There's some links here, and we'll go through those links. Um, of course, Dr. Bala mentioned the reporting sick and dead birds link and some mental health information. Um, we do go through biosecurity. And as Dr. Baldwin mentioned, biosecurity is not a prescription that, that we can give to everyone. It is very site and location specific. So these are very broad um, biosecurity recommendations. And your premise may need different biosecurity guidelines. Um, and, and like I said, that, that's very site specific. And we just don't want to write a whole prescription for every site knowing that it's going to, to be different. So these are very generic. And I'll go um, through the Defend the Flock website as well that USDA offers. But you can find that on our on our Facebook page. And of course, on the right hand side here is, is what to do with sick or unusual deaths in your flock. So once again, the CSU avian health hotline, Heather did a wonderful job of going over the protocol there, um, how to submit, who to call. Um, if you find dead or wild birds, and we actually have that on another web page as well. Um, and then uh, phone numbers for uh, USDA and, and our office are here and another link to our form to report. So at the bottom of our page, we have a ton of resources and it'd be nice if we could cover all of these resources and all of the information in a webinar, but unfortunately there's just absolutely too much information. So once again, defend the flock, other resources. Our webinar from last year is posted on the website. Our webinar for this year, we posted here as well. You'll also receive that link in the email we send you. Um, there are some technical services bulletins about avian influenza, and those are in English and Spanish as well. So feel free to share those. And um, on the right-hand side, we have a link to CPW information that Dr. Wood talked about, um, CDC. We do have our friends from CDPHE on the webinar tonight, and so they can answer any questions you may have about human health concerns. And um, I'll also... Um, address some of these questions in the FAQs as well. So that is our landing page. Uh, back here to, to the landing page, um, the top of it, uh, this red arrow, this is going to take you to another page. This is our, our response page. And so just click that gray box and, and we end up here. And this looks like um, the details of, of the response and, and where we've been in the past uh, basically 11 months. On our situation reports, if you click on situation reports, um, you will see the reports. Uh, this week will be report number 40, actually. We update that on Friday afternoons. And those situation reports basically discuss the details of all of the outbreaks and the current information associated with those outbreaks. So when you're going through those situation reports, if it is in red, that is current information for the week. Um, certainly, if you ever have any questions about what's on the situation report, reports, please don't hesitate to call our office. But they are updated every Friday, and they are open to, to um, the public to read. 
There's also a national SIT report as well um, that discusses what's going on nationally. Um, but this is, this is our Colorado situation report. Um, scrolling down, uh, once again, we have our reporting um, tool here and, and I'll go through using that reporting tool. Um, information on our, on our webinar, which um, that's happening now. And so um, you won't need, need that link. And as Dr. Baldwin mentioned, our updated guidance for poultry shows and exhibitions is on our website. And I'm not gonna go through all of the guidance document. You can click on it, you can read the entire document, but I do think it's prudent you know where to find the information because if you are um, having an event and, and you get to July and go, oh, I wonder if there's been any changes, you can come to our website and check out this document, make sure it's the current document um, and that you have the current information for the event that you're hosting. Um, if there were to be a, ma a major change to this guidance document, um, it would be very well published. And we don't, don't foresee that happening. However, um, unfortunately, like the rest of this outbreak, we haven't had a crystal ball to be able to tell. So um, covering a little bit um, further down on, on our website here, um, wild bird mortalities, um, Dr. Wood discussed um, you know, when, to, when to report those three or more dead birds in a two week period of time um, should be reported to the local CPW office. Um, they do have, CPW does have um, information. You can click down here on their link, High Path AI and Wild Birds to get some more information oh, excuse me, on that. And then over on our right hand side, information on mammalian detections, um, a little, little blurb on companion animals and I'll, I'll um, discuss some of that again in frequent, frequently asked questions. And then, of course, human detection. So we just send, send folks to um, the appropriate websites for information. As Dr. Baldwin mentioned, this is the um, map that we, we keep. This is current. And these are the detections. You can see on the map uh, the different colors. There's a key on the right-hand side that indicates what those colors are. And of course, you can see every corner of our state, unfortunately, has been affected. And likely, those areas that, that don't show colors probably do have some positive wild birds, positive mammals, um, maybe even some positive domestic birds. Um, we just haven't tested and, and had those reported. And so underneath our map is, is a live um, spreadsheet. So you can see what the current status is. The most recent confirmation that we had was the 13th, and that was a great horned owl in Moffat County. Um, and this, this is updated daily in our division. So as I mentioned, the map is interactive. If you click on the county, you can actually see the county information. So here you can see I've clicked on Weld County and all of the detections that have occurred in Weld County will come up. Uh, it, it's a, a long list, so you'll have to, to scroll down, but you can click on every county and see what detections have happened in those counties. So like I said, it is current, it's updated, and that is the Colorado situation. We'll go through the national um, situation um, in just a, just a second. So this is a really neat tool for folks to see, has my county been affected? What species, um, what birds, that sort of thing? Have there been any um, domestic poultry, um, et cetera? So, here we are back on our landing page, and we're going to just explore the APHIS website really quick. And, and this is going to be where the national detections of High Path AI are published. So clicking on, on this link here with the red arrow will take us to this page um, with the USDA. And this is um, maintained and managed by the USDA. Uh, you have the option clicking on confirmations of commercial and backyard flocks, detections in wild birds, and then the, the third link will take you to detections in, in mammals. So clicking on, on the backyard and commercial prems, this um, information of confirmed detections is, is a little bit newer. I just uh, stole this screenshot yesterday. So this was as of March 14th. You can actually see the detections um, here, the numbers of birds affected. And then when you scroll down, you can see the, the national map and of course, the um, last confirmation was um, March 13th in Pennsylvania. So you can look and see how many birds have been affected, et cetera. So really a neat 
interactive tool, see where the virus is um, in, the, in the nation and um, see how many birds are affected in each outbreak. And at the CDA, we, we do follow this information very, very closely. So back on our, on our landing page, another USDA resource is the Defend the Flock link. And this link will take us to all things biosecurity and everything that backyard producers and exhibition producers need to know about how to defend their flock from, from the disease. So we click on, click on Defend the Flock uh, icon. And here we are with a really interactive website on how to look up biosecurity symptoms and how to, um, you know, really protect your flock from high path AI. There's videos on here and all sorts of information. Um, they Defend the Flock has done their own webinars and so you can have access to those webinars as well. And uh, it's just really a wonderful website. Once again, I'll include that in the post webinar email. So everyone should be able to um, follow the links fairly easily for that. Um, here is, is kind of the meat and potatoes of of our new reporting system. And this is specifically for reporting sick or dead domestic birds. So poultry, um, not wildlife. So um, it, it, we just kind of, um, you know, we have to remember that, that wildlife needs to report, be reported to CPW. Um, domestic poultry gets reported to Department of Agriculture. Human concerns, um, we, we loop CDPAG or public health in for, for those concerns. But, Specifically for reporting our domestic poultry on our webpage, from the landing page, we have multiple different different ways. Here's here's one of the, the click buttons. There's one on the the other um, landing page as well on our response page. But clicking on this button will take us to this uh, owner report form. It's a self report form. You just fill it out. It's fairly simple: name, phone number, information about the birds, um, you know, an, an option to um, you know, write a, a long answer at the end about any concerns that you may have. And what happens with this form is it gets sent to Dr. Baldwin and myself, and then a veterinarian will call you if you do submit this form. So uh, you would expect to call um, at least within 24 hours of, of submitting the report, even on the weekends. Um, and then if you really have um, concerns, and you have not received a response, um, or you don't wanna use the online reporting tool, that's fine as well. Um, we have the option of, of just calling the office. Um, you can report your sick or, or dead birds um, by simply calling the office and you will be transferred to a veterinarian. You can take down your information and then determine whether or not we actually need to start an investigation for high path AI. I would say a good portion of the calls we received um, in 2022, uh, were great opportunities to educate our poultry owning um, producers, um, but, but most of them thankfully were not um, high path AI. Um, and not that we didn't test, but we certainly um, didn't, didn't see as, as much high path AI as we had calls for, which was, was a giant relief on our part, of course. So that's a, a really quick summary of what, um, what our website in, in our new landing page and new reporting tool looks like and, and how to differentiate, um, you know, some of that information. We kind of had it jumbled up there for a while and um, now, it, now it feels a little bit easier to use. And I know I want to leave a lot of time for, for questions that have been asked, um, but also kind of go over um, some FAQs. And, and some of these questions are questions that, that we get on a routine basis in our office. They're questions that were presented to um, Dr. Baldwin on the Defend the Flock webinar um, or questions that were posed in the webinar last year that I thought were really pertinent to ask or excuse me to answer those questions again again this year. So hopefully this will answer some of those questions in the Q&A and then once I get done with this we will go into the actual um, live question answer session and answer answer whatever remaining questions are, are in the Q&A. So I think the first, um, the, the big one that's really been looming over a lot of people are why isn't there a vaccine? Is there being, is the vaccine being worked on? Um, what birds would be vaccinated if there was a vaccine? And really the short answer is 
um, and, and Dr. Baldwin did mention this, is there are working groups that are working and discussing on the possibility of a vaccination. There isn't one currently here in the United States. You may have heard about a vaccination in other countries and there are vaccines in other countries. There is not one that's um, licensed and approved in the United States yet. Um, this conversation has been taken you know, as far up as the president. And so um, it, it is a very, very heated um, discussion. There are a lot of factors that go into why isn't there a vaccine now and when will there be a vaccine and who will get vaccinated when, when there is a vaccine. And so the, the vaccine has to be made um, as, as the strain shows itself, um, just like you know any influenza vaccine um, that, that a person would take for, for the flu, it's, it's the same with, with high path AI. And so it's not like we had stock, the ability to stockpile vaccines. And of course, um, we, we have some trade implications that have to be looked at. The type of vaccine would have to differentiate vaccinated from unvaccinated. And is this something that would be used in a commercial poultry situation or simply in backyard and um, you know, potentially um, zoo collections or, or high value collections? So there's so many different moving parts to, um, to this question. And yes, there's a lot of conversations about um, vaccine and there's a lot of complications to um, why isn't there one at the moment. So still a lot of discussion. I don't have the best answer for you on that and hopefully more information um, will, be, will be coming um, you know, over the next months regarding that conversation. Um, another, another popular question is, can this be transferred or transmitted from incubated eggs? And in general, we say no, because basically the process of incubation is heat treatment. And we know this virus does not really like heat. Um, and so technically incubated eggs, the virus would, would be killed during that incubation process. And so certainly if there's virus on the inside of the egg, the egg's not going to hatch and become become a viable chick. So if the incubation, if incubation takes care of the virus on the outside of the egg and you get a live chick on the inside, then, then you don't have virus on the inside of the egg. So, um, so we generally say no on this question, um, which, is, which is a good thing. All right, the next question, um, what is the time frame of incubation of the virus in wild bird feces? So, Incubation, the time um, from infection to the time of clinical illness is typically what we consider a few days, um, you know, generally about two to six days. It can be up to a couple weeks or approximately 14 days, um, but certainly the time of, of this depends on the strain and, and the species of, of the bird. Um, we know infected birds can shed and transmit virus for one to three weeks or even longer. Um, if they survive the infection, um, but this also depends on the strain and, and species, and it, it kind of brings up another good um, question, and that is, let's get there, can birds recover from high path AI? And the short answer is yes, especially the reservoir species that Dr. Wood talked about, right? So the wild waterfowl, um, they may be walking around with no clinical signs, but be infected with the virus. Um, and so um, were those birds clinically sick at some point and they recovered? Um, you know, that, that in wild birds, we, we probably won't know, right? And so um, we just have to suspect that, that they're, they are shedding. Um, but it's really uncommon for domestic poultry to survive, to survive this virus right now. Um, as a reminder, the, the mortality rate is more than 90%. And so we are seeing birds die at a very high rate. Um, there's no treatment, there's no vaccination as we just discussed, and this is a viral disease. So antibiotics, which treat bacterial infections, aren't going to help. And so, well, what you will see in some flocks, birds that don't die immediately from the infection, um, ultimately over, over days, um, th those birds will eventually succumb to the virus, uh, making it you know, like I said, over 90%, sometimes um, upwards of 100% mortality. Um, I know this question came up um, in the in the Q and A, so hopefully um, this will this will answer that. Um, but but there's really a number of ways that that we can make sure our equipment is is sanitized and and cleaned, um, and and what is effective for that. 
a simple bleach solution is is really the easiest solution um, that producers producers can make. And so um, the bleach solutions can be prepared in, in a number of ways, one to 10, one to 25, even one to 100, um, I've read. The EPA does have about 90 approved um, uh, disinfectants, excuse me, that are approved for um, killing and disinfecting against even influenza. Um, and another great one is Lysol. So folks can carry Lysol in their vehicle, spray it on their shoes, spray it on their floorboards if they've been, been out and about and are concerned about going home to their flocks. So between household bleach and um, Lysol, those are, those are approved and, and great ways to clean and disinfect any, any equipment. Um, a quick and, and easy recipe for making a one to 25 bleach solution is using um, household bleach, which is a, I believe a 5% bleach solution, um, adding one quart of that to six gallons of water and using it in spray bottles or foot baths. So um, hopefully that gives um, some information on, on that. Um, and then how long does, does high path AI virus last in, in, in the environment or in, in wild bird feces? We're, we're very fortunate because high path AI is kind of a wimpy virus. So it's very pathogenic to our poultry, but it doesn't survive long in the environment, especially in warm um, and dry conditions. It, it does not like heat and it does not like to be dried out. It likes to be kept um, moist and, and cool. And so um, heating and drying generally will deactivate this virus. So um, we know it can persist in soils and feces if um, and even pond water for varying amounts of time, depending on the environmental conditions. Um, so really what we recommend is, is making sure things are dry, um, you know, ultraviolet light, uh, which thankfully in Colorado is um, very sunny in Colorado. So it's a, it's a great way to, to kill the virus and, and disinfecting our, our boots with, um, with the disinfectants that we just talked about. Um, and 14 days in, in manure, um, once that manure has dried out, it's generally considered um, to have inactivated that, that virus. So um, it's relatively easy to, um, to get rid of the virus um, in the environment with good cleaning and disinfecting. So <clears throat> I think <laughs> this is kind of like the, the $64,000 question or, or maybe the $64 million question these days, but um, should we get new birds right now? And is it safe to bring new birds into our Cooper house? And I think one of the really important things Dr. Baldwin mentioned, how we prevent this disease from spreading is really trying to maintain a closed flock if you can, um, no co-mingling, right? So no birds from one flock um, meeting and, and mingling with birds from another flock. And so um, if you do plan on introducing new birds into your coop or your household, we do recommend a minimum of a 14 day isolation period up to about a month isolation period to keep those birds separate. And so that can really reduce the, the risk of, of potentially bringing avian influenza into, into your flock. And so um, the other option um, that, that we do recommend is uh, purchasing birds from MPIP flocks like Heather had mentioned, and those birds are routinely tested for avian influenza. So while not completely taking the risk down to zero. It does reduce the risk of, of bringing the disease into your flocks. But once again, um, maintaining closed flocks is the best way of, of pre preventing this disease. All right, and this is a question that we get asked all the time. And that is, is my dog or cat at risk for high path if it comes into contact with sick and dead birds or feces from, from infected birds? And I know it, it sounds really scary, right? Because Dr. Wood just talked about the mammalian species who have um, contracted and tested positive for high path AI. Is it a risk to your, to your dog or cat who could potentially come in contact with, with these um, dead or infected birds? Yes, I'm not going to say there's um, a zero risk, but it is very, very unlikely. Um, you know, your pets can certainly transmit the disease to your flock by, by walking through infected areas and then bringing the disease home. That's actually more likely to happen than the dog or cat actually becoming ill from the disease. And prolonged exposure to um, dead or dying birds or, or their feces could, could elevate the risk for um, dogs or cats to, to get sick from it. 
However, um, you know, we recommend keep, keeping your dogs away from, from dead or, or dying birds, um, not, not allowing them to scavenge on those carcasses and certainly not allowing them to, to eat feces, but it'd have to be um, significant prolonged exposure for, for those, um, you know, companion animals and pets to become ill. So as poultry producers, you're probably very curious, um, if I'm supposed to call a veterinarian, um, who do I call? And, and does the Colorado Department of Ag have a list of active veterinarians that see poultry in the state? Um, CSU does have a list of, of veterinarians that, that does see poultry, although um, that list is very limited. There's not a lot of poultry veterinarians in Colorado. Um, we are starting to see more and more small animal vets who are willing to see um, backyard poultry, so, so that is good. But certainly um, contacting the CSU avian health team if you're looking for a veterinarian in your specific area. Um, and, and I know Heather gave that number um, it's on our website. It'll also be in the post webinar email. So, and I know I'm going to these, these um, questions really fast, but um, we can clarify anything um, at the end. Cause like I said, I do want to leave enough time for our live Q and A. Um, how risky is it right now to buy baby chicks? Of course it's baby chick time and everybody loves going to the feed store and, and buying um, baby chicks or, or getting that online delivery and picking them up at the post office. Um, but should it be avoided for a little while? And certainly if you have poultry at home already, uh, there is a risk. Uh, doing the isolation um, minimum of 14 days uh, for up to 30 days is, is by far the best way to um, you know, help um, prevent disease spread. You know, so keeping them isolated. And certainly if you don't have poultry right now and, and you're thinking about getting baby chicks, um, then, then the risk is, is very low doesn't disappear completely, but, but it is very, very low. All right, and then um, the risk to indoor non-poultry birds. Uh, I, I don't think I wrote that exactly how I meant to say it, but is there any risk to indoor non-poultry birds such as parrots? And, and what should bird owners um, do to take extra care um, to, to make sure that their, their indoor non-poultry birds at home are safe? So, um, I probably would have said a little while ago, maybe a couple of years ago, that the risk to citizens or, or parrots was, was fairly low. Um, unfortunately, um, you still need to have good, good security and, and good biosecurity for, for your indoor birds. So taking off your outdoor shoes before entering the house or entering the room with your birds and, and um, practicing good um, personal um, biosecurity, such as hand washing, um, can really help prevent that. But is there a possibility that um, indoor birds such as citizens can become affected? Yes, there is. And my last question that really comes up um, during every single talk that we have is the, the human risk of, of getting high path AI and the food safety concerns. And with that, um, I wanna turn that question over to our, our folks at CDPHE who can, can discuss the human risk and food safety concerns. And then after that, we will go through the Q&A and hopefully we've answered some questions that you may have had and we can go through additional questions. All right, Robin, take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. McCarty. My name is Robin Weber. I'm the Field Epidemiology Unit Manager here at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And I do want to talk with you a little bit about the human health risk. In general, the risk to humans is very low with this virus. Um, the reason why we're involved in the response is because it is the same family of viruses that does have pandemic potential. If you remember the H1N1 um, swine flu outbreak in 2009, it's the same general family of virus. So we want to be on top of it, making sure that we're monitoring um, and, and that people are staying safe as they're responding to incidents of um, you know, flocks being infected with this particular virus. So in general, the, the risk to human health is very low when it comes to eating chicken and eggs. Um, in avian influenza does not present a food safety risk. Poultry and eggs are safe to eat, of course, when they're handled and cooked properly and that proper handling and cooking of all poultry and eggs um, to an internal of temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit is recommended in general for food safety, there's other things that you really don't want to infect yourself with by, by eating undercooked poultry and eggs. So that is our recommendation in terms of um, keeping your food safe. And 
In general, again, just to talk about our response here, we're doing that human monitoring for people who have been known to have had contact with animals that are infected with H5N1. Um, and that involves a 10 day monitoring period. That's the most likely incubation period. If you were to have had contact with an infected animal, you'd most likely become sick if you were to be infected in 10 days after that exposure. So we monitor individuals on a daily basis throughout that 10 day period. And that includes everybody from our partners at CDA and USDA who are responding to incidents at the commercial flocks. We're um, also working with farm owners and managers, as well as those, um, as well as the individuals who are working on those farms and having contact with those birds. That said, we have, as we've had um, wild animals infected over the last year, we've had a number of people, private citizens, who have picked up birds and taken them into wildlife um, centers for rehabilitation. So we generally will will work with those individuals that we are are made aware of who have had contact with those birds that have tested positive, and ensure that they're being monitored for that proper ten day follow up period. Um, that said, the risk to humans is low. Out of the millions of birds that have been infected worldwide that Dr. Baldwin was talking about earlier, we've actually only had seven instances of human infection from this particular virus. And in all seven instances, those infections were known to be caused after um, direct contact with infected birds. Um, there's also been no human to human transmission of this virus, but we're keeping an eye on things just to make sure that um, people are staying safe and to be, in, to be sure that if somebody does need testing, we can facilitate that with our state uh, public health laboratory as well as the CDC for confirmatory testing. And I do see a question about um, if geese died on the ice this winter and humans want to recreate in the summer, is there a risk to humans? That's um, a wonderful question. And as Dr. McCarty mentioned, this virus is very fragile. It's not super hardy. Um, that said, it can actually survive in frozen environments for up to 30 days. But once the sun starts to come out, once the temperature starts to raise here in Colorado, that virus is not going to survive in the environment for very long. And in fact, human transmission in the, the instances where people have come down with this, um, this particular strain of flu virus, they've had direct contact with poultry, specifically the, um, the birds themselves, their feces, the mucus. Um, so it really has to have that um, high degree of contact with that virus coming out of those infected animals and birds. So um, I do want to reassure you that the the risk of avian influenza from recreating on lakes and, and waterways in the summertime is going to be very low. That said, of course, if you happen to come across a lake or a waterway that it has a lot of dead birds on it, I would not recommend, um, first of all, don't touch the birds, don't have any contact with the birds. But second of all, I would not recommend going into that waterway because um, we just don't know what could be possibly causing that, that bird mortality and if it could affect our health. Great, thank you, Robin. And um, Dr. McCarty, do you wanna come back on and guide us through our Q&A um, session? And if anybody does have additional questions, please feel free now is the time, we've got 20 minutes left. So now is the time to drop more questions in the, the Q&A um, spot. Yeah, and it looks like um, a lot of the questions are related to um, some, some wild bird and, and wildlife questions. So um, we'll certainly have Dr. Wood answer those questions. Um, Dr. Wood, so one of the questions is, what are current recommendations for feeding wild birds at this time, um, especially related to um, wild bird feeders? And um, yeah, I think two questions were very similar about wild bird feeders. So if you wanna to answer to that for us, that'd be great. Sure, I know there've been quite a number of questions from folks related to songbirds and high path AI. Um, we have tested a handful of songbirds in our surveillance effort, but USDA has tested far, far more. We haven't had any cases in songbirds detected in Colorado for our surveillance. And USDA surveillance in songbirds has a pretty low incidence of detection of high path AI in songbirds. So they're really considered relatively low risk. It does seem like even when they are infected, they don't have um, a lot of shedding of virus. 
So from a wildlife standpoint and a wild bird health standpoint, we don't have any recommendations related to taking down bird feeders and the name of the type of AI. What I would say is there are a number of diseases that are transmitted uh, in bird feeders and most selling birds. So salmonella, trichomoniasis, um, finch conjunctivitis from mycoplasma. So we do actually see mortality events in songbirds associated with bird feeders quite commonly. So if folks are feeding birds, we just recommend really good um, hygiene around your bird feeders, clean them regularly, disinfect them regularly. And our greater concern with your bird feeders is going to be those other diseases and not so much the high path AI. Excellent. Thank you. And then another question, Dr. Wood, has high path AI been found in wild turkeys and grouse? And are the concerns for consuming hunted, hunted birds, which is a two-part question, I guess, one for you and one for, for Robin on the, on the consumption. Yeah, so um, we have tested a few turkeys in Colorado. We have not confirmed the case in any of our wild turkeys, but there were a number of cases in wild turkeys. I know up in Wyoming, and we did have mortalities in wild turkeys. We do assume that any birds in that sort of gallinaceous bird family, so all of the game birds, are likely susceptible. Um, though we just have not had any detections here in Colorado. And then as far as the risk and consumption, I'll turn that over to Robin. Yeah, so again, if you are hunting birds and um, you want to eat them, we recommend cooking them to that 165 degree internal temperature to stay safe. That said, um, I would not recommend eating birds that you found that were already dead. Um, because if we don't know what caused the fatality, we just don't wanna take that risk. So if you are, are hunting live, healthy birds and you um, are able to get one, then, then do cook it properly to that 165 degree temperature and you should be safe. Thank you, Robin. And then, since um, you're up, I'll have you answer another question for us. Is this the same strain with over 50% mortality rate to humans? And I'm not sure if that question needs to be clarified or. So I, I can talk a little bit about that specific strain in H5N1. Um, globally, for you know the last um, hundred years, really, we've known that H5N1 circulates. Not every single strain of H5N1 is the same. There's actually another strain that's currently circulating in parts of Southeast Asia that has had some high mortality that's been in the news lately. That's a different strain than what we have circulating here in Colorado right now. With this particular strain, which was newly identified first in 2021, we've had seven human cases with one fatality. Um, three of the cases have been severe and included pneumonia, and we've had three of the cases that were completely asymptomatic. We actually did have one detection in a human here in Colorado, and the only symptoms reported from that case were um, some fatigue. So as far as this particular strain of H5N1 goes, we're not seeing that same 50% fatality rate as other strains that have circulated in the past. The other thing to know about flu viruses is that they tend to be very species specific. Um, this virus is very good at infecting birds. It's just not good at infecting humans at all. So that's why we haven't seen more human cases despite the millions of birds that have been affected globally. Great, thank you. That was an excellent explanation, appreciate it. Um, our next question, I'm actually gonna turn this one over to Dr. Baldwin. Um, the question is, is it a good idea to quarantine birds coming into the shelter that our owner surrenders and strays? If we do the quarantine at the shelter, should adopters still quarantine from their flock when they get home? We quarantine for 10 days currently. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good question. So yes, um, the answer is quarantine both on arrival to the shelter and they should be quarantined if they arrive at, at a new owner's facility. I mean, quarantine and isolation is, is really going to be key, uh, regardless of where they're coming from or going to. We have had instances of avian influenza detections um, in a shelter setting. And so it is important that that is part of your intake process that you're very, very you know, prepared in the event that you do have birds that become sick um, or ill and die and are tested positive for avian influenza, that that's, that's taken into account. 
Um, and then of course, if they, those birds are adapted out, that they are again, isolated. Um, and we recommend that 14 day minimum time frame um, for that isolation period, whether it's at the facility um, or at the owner's new premises. Great, thank you. And I'll ask you too, Dr. Baldwin, do you recommend keeping a backyard flock inside a coop in addition to keeping a closed flock versus a free range flock? Yeah, again, really good question. Um, that is one of the options for trying to limit that contact with wild birds. Um, it now being a year into this outbreak, that's been something we've gotten the question a lot. How long do we keep our birds locked up? How long is it, is it okay? And how long is it safe for us to keep them locked in a coop? And I think there's a balance that we have to achieve between the birds, you know, physical health and also um, the bird's mental health. And if they're used to being outdoors and they're used to free ranging, um, you know, that, that is an option, but comes with increased risk of that exposure to wild birds. So I would say utilize that defend the flock tool and whatever your production practice is, whether it is free ranging your flock or whether that is, you know, keeping them indoors, then you can use that to try and have all of your biosecurity practices implemented, regardless of which flock type that you have. Great, thank you. And since you're answering questions, Dr. Bolden, I'll probably ask you a couple more. So um, real quick, Amanda did ask, will this presentation be available later to view? And yes, we will be sending out um, the post webinar email with the link to this presentation um, and webinar, and also it will be available on our website as well, and you will receive those links. They are also in the chat. So um, hopefully that answered your question there. And was this virus in full force in August and September of 2022? And it sure was. So we were detecting it in um, wild birds and in domestic birds um, across the state, state back then. So absolutely. Um, and then I think, I think we've probably answered this question in the, in the actual presentations, but are some kind of birds more or less likely to have avian influenza, i.e. ducks and geese versus doves? And so I feel like we've done a okay job covering this, but Dr. Baldwin, if you just want to clarify, that would be great. Yeah, I can. I can answer that. And actually, Dr. Patalonia is on. And Dr. Patalonia might be the right person to answer this. She is the avian expert that we have in the state and the director of CSU's Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. So Dr. Pavlini, I'm gonna throw this one to you. I think maybe on both the wild bird and the domestic bird, if you wanna just answer that on both sides would be great. Hi everybody. Um, so Morgan, you said ducks and waterfowl compared to doves or ducks compared to doves? Correct. Got it, dove, duck, yeah. Um, so ducks, geese and other waterfowl and shorebirds. They're known as the reservoir for all influenza viruses. They're highly, highly susceptible to influenza viruses. Um, other birds, depending on the species, are typically less susceptible to viruses. So there's some species specificity and it depends on the virus itself. So different viruses, um, different species will be more susceptible to them. Um, as um, Mary talked about earlier, we've not seen a lot of cases in the peri domestic birds, so songbirds and the like. There have been a few cases in doves that I can remember. I don't know if any in Colorado, Mary, it sounds like no that you can think of. Yeah. So other places in the US, um, but they're not known as super highly susceptible species. Now, the other thing we also know about birds and susceptibility and flu viruses is that it also depends a lot on how the birds, um, their kind of normal behaviors. So birds that live in large groups, um, particularly large groups for long periods of time, particularly in the winter, they're gonna be a lot more likely to spread virus than birds that live in smaller groups or singularly. Um, so just a few things we know about influenza viruses in general. That was perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin, for sending that over to Dr. Pavlonia to answer as well. Um, we do have one last question, and we have we have ten minutes, so we can we can have more questions. And and I hope I answered this question uh, in my FAQs about um, hunting dogs potentially being at risk. Um, you know, for for retrieving those birds, and what can you do to minimize those risks? So certainly, the risk is is fairly low, and minis minimizing exposure. Um, of those dogs to potentially infected birds and, and bird waste, um, you know, is certainly one of the recommendations. 
Um, but if, if your pet is showing signs or your hunting dog is showing signs of illness, we do recommend seeking treatment or consultation with your veterinarian and uh, monitor for signs of fever um, and infection. So minimizing exposure and monitoring are, are really the two things that we can recommend at this point in time. And certainly I will open it up to the rest of the panelists if they have any additional um, comments on that particular question or any of the other questions, um, or if they'd like to offer any other great words of wisdom tonight. Just wanted to say, Morgan, that I, I dropped in the chat box, USDA does have a guidance document for hunters um, that's out there. And there has been messaging, of course, through CPW and CDA has sent out some hunter specific messaging as well. That that particular guidance document does not address the question on um, hunting dogs, but but does just offer some um, some guidance for hunters in general. And Mary, I don't know if you have anything um, CPW specific for hunters that might be helpful. So all of the hunter guidance that we have shared has all been developed by human health folks. So we always defer to CDPHE, CDC, all of the guidance for that on the risk to human health. So that's where all of that guidance comes from. All right, let's turn it over to you, Dr. Baldwin, if you have any closing, closing comments for our group. Uh, well, first, I just want to thank um, all of the wonderful panelists. Um, one of our, our new Ag Emergency Coordinator has said many times, and it's my favorite new catchphrase, is that emergency management is a team sport. And um, we have one of the, the best teams around that, that really put a lot of time and effort into our response. And that's not just the people that you see on the screen. It's a lot of other people that are attending the webinar right now, our field veterinarians, our USDA team, our other CDA team. Team. We've got people all across the state um, that have done this. So really um, big thank you to everybody that has been part of this response and for the folks that you see on the screen right now that have been just um, instrumental in, um, in our response here in the state. And then a big thanks to everybody that has joined this evening. Um, it's really important for us to get these updates out, get the word out. And so please share this with your friends and your family and make sure that everybody that is a bird owner knows what the status is, knows what to expect in the coming days and, and weeks and months. Um, you know, we're not through this. Um, and I think that's the important thing is, is we're, we're really anticipating that we're going to see another spike. Um, so getting these resources out, getting this knowledge out is going to be critically important right now. So um, again, thank you so much for joining. If you guys do need anything, if you have anything, hopefully we've given you all the tools and all the resources that you need. And if we haven't, reach out. Um, we are always available. You see us on the screen right now. That's who you're going to talk to when you call um, and, and get whatever information that you might need. So um, thanks again so much. And thanks so much to Dr. McCarty for organizing this, Becky and Olga on our team um, for working with everybody and getting this, this organized. I think hopefully this information gets out to all the bird owning, owning public that needs to have it. And um, thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody.